security of Google. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? In the so today I'm going to talk about uh, Google Apps Engine security. Uh, the talk is divided into three parts. The first part is different aspect of the security of Google Apps Engine. So the first part is about what kind of mistake developers can do when implementing Google Apps Engine application. The second part is uh, what are the specific aspects of uh, Google Apps Engine regarding the infrastructure. It's more about tips you can use when doing a pen test. And the last part uh, is about um, a study of the sandbox security implemented by Google. So, um, let's get a big picture about Google Apps Engine. It's a platform as a service provided by Google. So, they give you a software development kit so that you can use to develop, test, and deploy application on the live environment, which is Google Platform, Google Data Center. You can have your data hosted in Europe if you want. So, you don't have to give all of your data to the US. Uh, currently, Google Apps Engine supports different programming language, but today I will only talk about Python programming language. Uh, the only thing is uh, the second part regarding the infrastructure may also match some other programming language implementations, such as the Java or PHP one. So I'm not working at Google, so this is my point of view of the architecture. Uh, it's definitely not accurate. Um, I guess it's more complex in reality. But what you can see here, what is important is that uh, Google Apps Engine application are not only reachable through HTTP protocol, but you can also reach them with speedy protocol or quick protocol, which are alternative to the HTTP. And the other important uh, point is that all the Google Apps Engine application can be reached through IP6. So normally we are only used to get some services exposed on IP4, here you also have some IP6. Um, you can see at the bottom of the slide uh, a link between the Google environment and the customer network. This is called the Secure Data Connector. This feature is uh, deprecated by Google and will not work anymore, uh, I think, uh, at the middle of next year. But I will talk a bit about this feature uh, in this talk. So let's first uh, talk about the uh, GA implementation, that means the mistake developer can do. So just a quick uh, reminder regarding uh, classic web vulnerabilities. So definitely you can still have all the very simple vulnerabilities such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, etc. Uh, Google Apps Engine is just a hosting platform plus some API. So if you want to develop your own application, you still have to pick some library, some framework from internet or whatever. And as usual, you have to correctly use this framework, otherwise you will bring some vulnerabilities inside your code. So that's why you can still find some direct ID reference vulnerability or XML entity injection vulnerability. Okay, so let's talk about uh, API, which are more specific to Google Apps Engine. So one of these API is uh, URL fetch API. It allows you to request uh, another web service from your application. <coughs> so basically, you could be interested in requesting two different kinds of web service, as an external web service, like a web service exposed on the internet. So here, what you have to remember is that uh, the default settings are not very let's say, uh, secure. Uh, SSL certificate validation is not enabled by default, so you have to keep, to keep saying to the developer, always use the, the, the best practice, always use a check certificate, they are true, etc. Um, the other aspect of uh, URL API, which is interesting, is that uh, in order to identify a request, when you have one application requesting another application, and you want to know who is re requesting you, Normally, Google provides some trusted HTTP header. So if you see this HTTP header, X app engine inbound app ID, you know that Google is telling you this request comes from this application. But the other thing is Google also provides this information in the user agent string, which is at the bottom of the slide. And sadly, we have seen that some developers are using this information in order to identify with the caller. 
So definitely, we can just spoof this uh, HTTP header in order to spoof some identity when you're contacting one, one web service from the other. Um, we have other uh, API that which may be used uh, in a Google Apps Engine application. Uh, so you can use a socket API if you are uh, paying some uh, subscription with Google. Here it's the same case if you're trying to do some SSL with socket API, you have to take care of using the right parameter and using the right function. It's not secure by default. <coughs> um, you have a channel API. A channel API is a, cha is a feature that allows you to um, set up a connection between a GAE application and JavaScript code. So it can be used as an example to set up multiplayer game or chat software, this kind of things. What is interesting from the pen testing point of view is uh, most of the time you won't be able to get some cookie if you're exploiting a cross-site scripting because of HTTP only or this kind of stuff. And there is an interesting cross-site scripting payload that you can do is to steal the token that identifies the channel. Because if you are able to steal this token with a cross-type scripting, then you, you bring the token back to the attacker computer, and then you can just connect to the channel, and you can sniff the communication without interacting with the victim anymore. So this is uh, uh, something fun to do with cross-type scripting. Uh, when the channel API is used. And finally, it's um, just, um, I would say, a best practice is uh, you can use a task queue mechanism is Google Apps Engine, and each job worker is defined by a, a URL, and you're not forced to protect this, this entry point. <coughs> that means sometime, uh, just with an anonymous user, you can connect an application and trigger some uh, queue cut job worker that may change the behavior of the application. It's definitely very specific to, to the application, but you have to remember here that we will provide a way to secure the task queue and you have to use this feature, otherwise it's, it's not a good thing. So um, I'm uh, often asked about uh, remote code execution on uh, GAE applications. So yes, there is two ways of getting uh, code execution. I'm talking about Python code execution, not system, code, system level code execution. Uh, the first way is the easiest way. Uh, you have compromised a Google account that is allowed to manage an application you're targeting. So if you own the application, you can just replace the application. Obviously, you will get some Python code execution. But the, more, uh, the, the other way is to exploit a vulnerability in some kind of unserialized feature, which in Python will be most of the time PyCall uh, unserialization. I will show you in a few slides uh, uh, a concrete case of uh, using uh, unserialized exploit. But you may wonder, OK, so at one point, you get a remote code execution on the GAE application. And then what can you do to get a persistent access? Because we want to reverse connect. We want something to see the output. And we want to be able to connect again and run again some, some kind. So uh, we can just use uh, wonderful features uh, that, that come with a GAE application. And we can just register XMPP Angular. XMPP is a protocol used for chat, Google Talk, and this kind of stuff. So with only five lines of code, which can be embedded in a Python payload, you just ask the application, the web application, to connect on JTOL and to say, OK, whenever you receive a message, execute the code and send me the reply. So instead of having a bind shell or whatever, with Google Apps, you can have, let's say, a Google Talk shell. So it can be useful when you're working on a very complex application and you want to do some introspection in the, in the remote application. Uh, and the last aspect of uh, application implementation is regarding denial of service protection. So we don't have a blue screen here, but we have uh, over quota screen. The thing is, uh, most of the API provided by Google are built on a shared basis. So if, when you're using CPU memory, when you're requesting a data store, when you're requesting uh, remote services, 
you get some quota to get consumed, and once you reach the limit, either you will pay a lot of money if uh, it's like an open bidding account, or at one point you will reach this screen. So in order to protect against denial of service or overbidding attack, you can set up some quota, like per minute or per hour quota, or daily quota, sorry. And another protection layer that you can use is IP blacklisting. Uh, Google provides you a web interface where you can uh, add some blacklisting, blacklist some IP range, etc. The so only thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, Google Apps Engine applications are always reachable through IP6. And with IP6, you can get thousands of different address, random address, and it's very difficult for an administrator to know this address is attacking me, and I have to aggregate the address to find the right mask, etc. This is quite difficult. So we don't really think uh, this is something you can do in real life, blacklisting IP6 address. So that was for um, the mistake you can do when implementing a GA application. And now I will talk about the specific aspect of GA environment and what part of the process may help when doing um, security assessment. So one of the most obvious but uh, sensitive point is that um, you cannot replicate Google services at home. So uh, Google provides so many services. You, if you want to replicate them, then you would have to set up a lot of server, and then you, it will cost you a lot of money, and there is no point in migrating to Google. So here, uh, you will have to use the live environment with test code. You cannot do all the test develop, the development on your own site. You will have to use the Google services. Another reason that you have to do this is because some bugs will only trigger when you're connecting to the live system. We have some features such, such as authorization mechanism, secure data connector, or quota handling stuff. You will not get this kind of trouble when you're developing on, on server. You will only get this trouble when you're using Google. So what we see in real life is uh, developers use production credential on their system. So what we are able to do when we are doing a penetration test is we compromise at one point the workstation of a developer and we just get some credential, we get some OOT token and this kind of stuff. And normally in a penetration test when you compromise the developer account, you may get some credential but you, ne you barely get production cred credential. And here most of the time it's always the same thing. You, you pawn a developer and you pawn the, uh, the application with a production credential. There is one way to limit this kind of uh, security issue is to use a different Google Apps domain, one for development and one for production. That way, your developer will get will be able to do whatever they want on the test domain, and if you compromise the test domain, you will not be able to jump to the production domain. Uh, so we have one use case of the problem of replicating Google at home is the provisioning API. The provisioning API is an API that allows you to automate user management tasks. So it's mostly used by a very large company who need to create or delete user account in a batch. And in order to have this API working, you need a, a separate domain key. This separate domain key is like a, the, very, the most sensitive asset regarding a Google Apps domain. If you get access to this um, to this secret, then you can usurp the identity of anybody which is part of this Google domain. So um, here is also the, the same problem as I was saying before. Uh, you cannot replicate Google user management code in your place. So you will request the live Google services. So you will end up having the domain secret key in your development code. And that's the worst thing to do because when we are doing penetration tests, we recover this domain key. And then we don't, we don't need anymore to uh, crack user password, to crack user account, etc. We just use this domain key as Google, OK, please generate a token for this user, for this user, for this user, and then you can just use Google services, uh, Google Drive, Google Mail, whatever, and get access to the information. You have to remember that 
it's not <coughs> as easy to do the same thing in uh, other environments. Let's say, for example, in Microsoft environment, a domain admin cannot read the email of an exchange, of all the exchange mailboxes. I mean, technically it can, but if you're just clicking in the mailbox, you won't be able to open it. And here it's different, because once you're super admin, you can, dump, you can usurpate the identity of all the users. Um, yes, one of the cool uh, pen testing uh, trick is to, uh, after you have been able to uh, impersonate an identity, is to use Google services to look for password. Like when you're normally doing a pen testing, you're trolling uh, hundreds or thousands of file share, NFS server, all this kind of stuff. You just go to Google Drive, type secret or password in the query field, and you get all the data very quickly. It's very helpful. Um, okay, so here is another aspect of uh, the infrastructure of uh, Google Apps Engine is the difference between a non-environment and a version. <coughs> In the classic world, what we have is at least two environments. We have a development environment and a production environment. Development is supposed to be not secure or kind of secure, and production is supposed to be the secure version. Um, there is one one point, which is that we only have one version of the application which is running on the production side. We may have several versions which are deployed, but only one will be running. And the difference here with Google is that uh, you can run multi you can run very easily multiple versions of the same application at the same time. So what we are used to see is that a same Google account is uh, is the administrator is owning several versions of the application. And some of these versions of the application have debug feature, or they don't have the debug feature, and all of them share some resources. So here, the, the typical thing is uh, instead of attacking the production environment, which is without debug feature, which is more hard enough, you can just target the development environment <coughs> and then try to bridge from one environment to the other environment, which in terms of Google Apps Engine is switch from one version to the other version. So here there is a mix between environment and version. Um, so let's say uh, we are attacking a development uh, version and we are trying to, to boost on the production version. So this is what I'm, I'm just talking about. So, Normally, you can use some name, uh, an API called the Namespace API. It allows you to make an isolation layer between different versions of an application. By default, it's not used. You have to, uh, to make your code use the Namespace API. So here is that most of the people uh, trust uh, data coming from the backends, from either database or like cache backends or whatever. Um, as our feedback is that many, many Python applications are using Pickle system, either by using Pickle directly or by using a library or framework that will use Pickle for the session management or other kind of stuff. And as I said before, uh, Pickle is uh, a way to, uh, to get an exploit to, uh, to execute some code. <coughs> so here, what you can do is to have an avid version of the application which push some avid data in the main cache backend or in the database backend. And when the production version of the very same application try to gather the data, it triggers a payload and get exploited. Um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, um, so we have a feature provided by Google. It's a download kill switch. Once you activate this feature, you cannot download the source code of your application anymore. And here, what we are trying to do is to use this, uh, I attack one version from the other version in order to recover the, the source code of the application. So as you can see at the bottom, it's like an inliner, Python inliner, which will, uh, when it's injected in an application, will post back the source code of an application to another place. So this is a, a typical payload that you may inject into a pickle exploit when you are targeting one version from the other version. Um, OK, 
Okay, now um, I will talk about, if you remember, the uh, network uh, architecture I presented at the beginning, there were a link between Google infrastructure and the enterprise network, which is called Secure Data Connector. This Secure Data Connector acts as a SOX proxy. So you have a SOX, there is a SOX uh, server in Google, and the, uh, the endpoint is in the enterprise company, which can go to different applications. So the goal of this feature is sometime you will have your Google Apps Engine applications that need to request your internal web services. We have seen it in real life uh, for applications using like Jira or Wiki, which are only available within the company network. So here the fact is a secure data connector only work if the request that is trying to go through the secure data connector has been performed by a user which is authenticated with a Google account. So you need to be authenticated with Google, otherwise your request won't go through the SDC. And the problem is when you're on the way on uh, migrating to Google Apps Engine, you may have some user accounts that are not Google user accounts. You may have some user accounts which are stored in the MySQL database or in a file or whatever. And here, in order to have your application work with a secure data connector, what you will have to do is to put some hard-coded credential in your application in order to deal with the case of the standard account you can see at the bottom. That means when the user is from Google, is authenticated with a Google domain, it's fine, but when it's coming from a third-party account, then you need to use this hard-coded account. So here, uh, when we are thinking about hard-coded account, we just think about when you're doing a penetration test, if you get access to the source code of the application, you will likely find some hard-coded credential used by the SDC. Another um, thing that we've been <coughs> with the SDC is to try to bypass uh, some network filtering that could be set up within an enterprise network. So here uh, we are supposed to be on the right side within the enterprise network and we are trying to reach some server which is in a uh, DMZ zone. Um, so we can use the fact that the SDC channel can be configured as a filtering proxy but from what we have seen it has never been it is never correctly configured, but whatever. The thing is you can, you can tell Google only requests coming from this application will be allowed to go through the SDC connector. However, in real life, what we, what we see is that uh, from the corporate network, we just deploy a new application in the Google app domain. You don't need any special privilege to do this. You can use it with a standard account. And from this application, you will request your internal server and you ask Google, please go through the SDC channel. So that way you can just request, I mean, use an edit application as a proxy in order to bypass some internal network filter. This is more uh, theories and uh, practical things. We have been trying to use this kind of attack, but in real world, most of the time you will just be able to directly attack your server and not have to go through this. Uh, Google. Um, okay, so you have been talking about the code, I mean, the a mistake you can do in the implementation. I've been talking about the problem, not the problem, but the risks that come with uh, infrastructure on the process of using Google Apps Engine. And now I will go low level at understanding the Python um, sandbox. So this is a, the big picture of the uh, Google Apps Engine Python sandbox. Here, what you have at the bottom is the Google Apps Engine application, which are using the API, the Google Apps Engine API are using the Python API. And here you have the first level of security, which is based on module replacement or function patching or this kind of stuff. This is uh, the main security layer provided by the development environment. I mean the servers that come with the software, the, the software development kit. Above this layer, you will have the uh, Python virtual machine. 
And that's it for the development environment. After, when we uh, talk about uh, the implementation at Google, you have a layer above this, which is native client. And we have some additional uh, hardening restriction on the top of that, but we have not seen them. So it's just, uh, we've been stuck under a native client layer. So um, let's talk about the development environment. So there is definitely a big, big difference of security level between production and development here. Uh, the protection provided in the development environment are barely just function patching, as I said before. So here, as an example, when you're trying to open a ETC password from Python code, it just say you cannot access the file. But obviously, the software, the SDK server, still need to use open. So there is a reference to open somewhere in the Python code. And you can just use some Python trickery by using underscore, underscore <coughs> base, underscore, underscore, etc. to get back a reference to the open function. And then you can just open etc password or whatever uh, again. So it's really just a security at the function level. And you have another example is to you, so th this time it's more, it's not about patching a function, it's about patching a whole module. So here uh, the module OS is restricted, so you cannot uh, run os.popen or this kind of stuff to run command. However, as you may know, OS is just a wrapper around POSIX module on, on Linux, so you can just import POSIX module and run command uh, program. So there is no really big deal regarding the development environment security, uh, which is what is more interesting is uh, what is happening uh, at Google. So here I will try to explain uh, if here we have been exploiting the high level API restriction during the last two slides. On now I will talk about exploiting the VM Python layer. So uh, <coughs> Python is a virtual machine, so virtual machine can with bytecode, with opcode, etc. So uh, here we are interested into one of the opcode, which is called load constant. This opcode is take uh, a Python object in a tuple, which <coughs> is like an array, and push this value onto the stack. So here the thing is that uh, this value is picked at a specific index, and this index <coughs> is not checked when Python is compiled without <coughs> debug mode. So it's, it's uh, even commented in the code, trading safety for speed, so it's pretty clear. Um, uh, in Google Apps Engine, uh, Python virtual machine is not compiled with debug mode, so that means we will be able to use this bug in order to try to exploit the virtual machine. So I've been talking about uh, opcode that is able to pick an object within a tuple, which is an array. So here I'm talking about how to calculate the right <coughs> index in order to have Python virtual machine to pick an arbitrary object in memory. Because what we, what we want to do is to set up a fake Python object and ask Python, this is a real Python object, now use it. <coughs> so here the trick is to use the ID function, ID Python function. This uh, function returns a base address of any object in the Python virtual machine. And you can use the fact that uh, every Python object have a either on a variable size part. Um, so you can just use a basic arithmetic to calculate what is the index that you can use. So as you can see on the left side, you have the tuple, which is an array with two objects. And we are trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to create a fake third object, which is arbitrary data. So here you just use ID, ID, ID subscribe to everything and you get the correct index. Okay, so we know how to calculate an index in order to ask the virtual machine to go at one specific place we will control, but we don't know really know why we are trying to do this. Now we are trying, what we are looking for is a gadget that can be used to read and write everywhere in memory. And then what we will try to do is to use the tuple index plus the binary object we mix everything and we, will, we want to be able to read and write everywhere in memory. So here we have the binary object. This binary object normally is only only allow you to uh, 
to read and write within the bound of allocated buffer. So normally you don't control the buffer. But you can see in the middle of the screen, uh, in red, that this p uh, binary object, it's like uh, at the end you have the buffer size and the buffer pointer. The goal is to use some arbitrary value here, so you can have binary uh, objects that read and write everywhere. Here the trick is we use a string object. We could use uh, uh, many different kind of Python object, but we choose to use a string object as a container. So this is a real Python object, but it embeds fake Python object. And the string, the content of the string object will be our binary object. And in order to, to forge this, uh, this information, you need to get some uh, some information such as a vtable pointer. Vtable pointer is a list of function pointers that are uh, that allow you to perform some operation on the binary object. In order to get these addresses, you still use id function, id, id, id. You get some pointer everywhere, so you are able to to forge this binary object. You put you put all of this in a string object. When I'm saying in a string object, I'm really talking about the str things in Python. So we know uh, binary words. We know how to calculate an index. So now we, what we want to do is to ask the Python virtual machine, OK, give us back this binary so we can read and write everywhere. So here uh, we use two hop codes, the long constant and return value. And I explained before to cal calculate the right index. The only little trick is you have to use two different containers. When I'm talking about container, I'm talking about the, st fake, the string object I was talking before. Um, you need to have a pointer pointing to the binary. Then you adjust your index in order that it points to container 2. And then you can just spit on to get your uh, binary, your fake binary object. So at this point, what you have is some Python code that when it executes, it allows you to read and write at an arbitrary address with arbitrary content. So let's just say it's uh, the basics of every software um, exploitation. So here is just nothing, uh, nothing new regarding how to get some code execution from a read and write memory. So we are just using the fact that the Python virtual machine has a lot of function pointer everywhere in memory, so we can just we place a function pointer with what we want in order to control the way Python will execute some, uh, some command. So here, what we, uh, if, if you take an as an example the function uh, seek, sorry, uh, when you're calling some Python code that does a seek, then it will go to the Python virtual machine. Python virtual machine will call the libc fseek. So this call will go through the PLT and PLT will go to the libc. So here we have several steps before calling the actual function. And we can patch any of this stage in order to intercept the control flow, the control flow. Just by using this, this trick, you can call mmap function and protect function. And if you are able to call this function, that means you can just push a shell card and execute it, uh, and you win. So this will work. This work everywhere. I mean, if you have some Python code running, you can use the very same technique everywhere. <coughs> Python 32 bits, Python 64 bits, and all the, all the Python. It even works in, on Windows, etc. The problem is not working at Google. Why? Because they're using native client. So with native client, you, can, you, you cannot change uh, the protection of your memory page. You cannot uh, push your shell code and execute it. So we have to find another way to still benefit from the bug while not being killed by the native client sandbox. <coughs> so here, uh, the trick is to use what I've said before uh, with some additional heuristics in order to locate some symbols which are available in the sandbox. So uh, as you can see, <coughs> We start by using the ID function on some Python objects. So that means we will get some uh, address which are allocated in memory. Then we read this address. So we read the content of the object. The, co the object contains a vtable. So the vtable is a uh, 
function pointer table, so you read the function pointer table. If you get a pointer to a function, then you will know where is the dot text section of a binary. So you, get, you can read the dot text section. By disassembly, by doing some disassembly of the dot text section, you can locate the PLT, etc., etc., etc. And you end up finding, okay, this is a, the MMAP function, this is the FRIP function, this is blah, 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 etc. So at one point, you are able to recover all the Lipsy symbols. And now starts the, the more interesting part at Google, is you have to uh, identify where the native client loader is loaded in memory. So it's, uh, in fact, it's quite easy. It's just a heuristic based, like you can use in every exploit. And at one point, you ended up looking for the native client loader structure. And there is a linked list of loaded library, like there is with ld.so on any Linux system. So from this point, uh, you are able to recover all the symbols that are loaded in the environment. That means you can get access to all the binary codes, to all the codes that Google is using to implement Google App Hosting and Google App Engine. I mean, you can really study the way the Google App Engine application is implemented. So, uh, I've been talking about uh, this vulnerability in, uh, in uh, Akit the Box a few months ago, and we are stuck here, so we have been working hard about trying to evade the native client sandbox. We barely fail at evading it. But uh, we have found some very interesting stuff. On what we are being able to do is to understand how the isolation layer has been developed and how all the different features provided by Google Apps Engine have been implemented. So one of the funny things we have been doing is to port uh, John the Reaper on Google. Well, it's only support a few algorithms, but it's just a sample of what you can do. I mean, we cannot push a shell card on Google and run it. However, we are still able to call any function that is loaded in memory. So here we are just reusing the libc function, which is doing some crypto, and that function will be obviously faster than Python code. So here we use the fact that uh, that will run faster to um, do something. Um, so you get some native CPU perf, but it's uh, it's only with a two two gigahertz core. Or it's not impressively fast. And yes, yeah, so the interesting thing is to reverse engineering, to reverse engineer the, the Google implementation and in order to try to find some vulnerability. We are pretty confident that the native client layer is, uh, is quite secure. We have been, I think a lot of people have been working on that topic and it looks interesting, but very, very complex. And the thing is, we know that above the native client layer, there will be additional layer of security, like SecComp or whatever or should. And we are focused on trying to find vulnerability inside the feature provided by Google. So, uh, as you can see, there is some uh, the name of some C++ classes, such as a speaker UD RPC. So this is private code from Google, and we, are, we have been trying to look for you know, in this code. We don't have anything interesting on this point so far. OK, so um, that's it for Google Apps Engine. So my final word would be, be that um, <coughs> security of Google Apps Engine is just not one layer. I mean, in the production side, I'm not talking about the software development kit server, which is <coughs> crap regarding security, but uh, on the production side, even if you, if, you, if you smash the first layer of security, you get layer above, so it's correctly done, I mean, it's uh, according to best practice. Uh, we have tried hard to hit the native client layer, but to us, it was not easy to do some, some interesting stuff. The thing you have to remember when dealing with the Google Apps Engine environment is that, uh, as usual, developers still have to, to take care. Are they using the right library? Are they using the right API, etc. Um, another, another aspect, because of the, the, thing, the fact that you cannot replicate Google at all, if you compromise developer workstation, you will likely get access to very sensitive credential, which is not always the, the case in the standard world. 
And the last point is that you can use the SDC agent, which is the, the, the component that allows you allow Google to, to come back to your enterprise network in order to bypass some filtering that may set up your enterprise. So again, I say the SDC agent will be uh, killed uh, at, the at the middle of next year. Uh, it won't be easy for a company to migrate off of this feature because uh, Google does not provide any replacement. So you only have two choices, is to host your system at Google, so push more data to Google, or the other way is to use a socket API, socket API, sorry, or the URL fetch. And if you're doing this, that means you will open more gate on internet because the, the goal of the secure data connector was to have a unique entry point which was, who was able to filter the incoming connection. And here you won't be able to do the same thing. So there may be some case when vulnerability will come, will come after the SDC is, uh, is gone. And finally, I would say that uh, Google Apps Engine is quite complex. And I'm talking about the way the authorization and authentication model works. It's not uh, that complex, but uh, as long as you're talking about OHO token or whatever, uh, in real life, developers don't understand anything about it. So uh, it's, uh, even to have some password hashing function, it's already hard in real life. So you can imagine about implementing OHO in the right way. That's it. So if you have any question, I will be pleased to answer. Hi. Uh, so it appears that compromising the dev environment is not a big deal, but if it's uh, hosted on Google Data Centers, why is it not uh, a big deal for them? Because most of the time, the developer who, who will own the development environment will also be the same person who owns the production environment. That means if you compromise, uh, if you compromise this developer, you will be able to compromise the production side. It's because the very same person is the owner of the both version of the application. I'm speaking about the underlying server. When ah. you execute uh, LS or yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, this is uh, on your server, on the, with the software development kit server. And uh, you may wonder why to try to execute code on a SDK server. And we are using this, uh, <coughs> let's just say I'm doing an internal network penetration test. And at one point I get access on the system, but I don't have the password for the local accounts. But I got uh, unprivileged uh, access on this box. So what I do is just connect on localhost to access the administration console in order to uh, elevate from one identity to the other identity. So it can be a way to get access to more user accounts uh, in internal network. Have you had any uh, response or comments from Google regarding your research? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, they consider that it's not a big deal regarding security. Because, uh, as I said, we only hit the first uh, layer of security. What I don't understand is that they are not trying to fix the SDK server. It could be very easy to fix that environment. The production environment, uh, they could fix it, but they will get some performance penalty. It's, it's on, on purpose that is disabled. And it looks like they really trust the native client layer. So actually, you can still use the very same vulnerability, and I think you will be able to use it for a very long time. You have to keep in mind that uh, Google Apps Engine environment is also exposed on PHP, Java, and Go. So obviously, there, there are some PHP virtual machine escape, and there are some Java virtual machine escape. So here, they are not thinking about uh, protecting Python. They are really thinking about protecting the above layer. Some 
Google is looking for people to look for vulnerability in native client. Mm -hmm. Last question. Uh, how much did it cost to run this research on the servers? How much did it cost to what? Because you have to pay for the instance and stuff like that. So. <laughs> uh, no, because we have a very old account that is still free. <laughs> 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 uh, but we have some customers who have uh, a lot of money and they have a 